Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Massimiliano Maineri, um, the co-chair of the um, um, uh, Leipzig Health Centrum in Leipzig, Germany. And um, I worked at Toronto General Hospital as a fellow and as a staff for many years. And I'm always uh, extremely pleased to be invited to this um, conference that's been grown through the years and has uh, actually made it through very difficult time that we could have never foreseen when this whole adventure started many years ago um, with the hard work of Annette Vegas. Um, what I was asked to talk about was uh, today the, the use of echocardiography for intraoperative assessment of mitral valve repair, specifically for minimal invasive surgery. I have a few disclosure. I've received honorarium from Abbott to talk about mitra clip, which is not a topic in my talk today. Um, in Leipzig, we are a Philips reference center. So all of the images we have, they come from Philips machines. Unfortunately, we don't get any money for it, but uh, we get equipment and um, software from the company. And I'm also part of the writing committee of the National Board of Echocardiography for the TEXM. Um, I wanted to um, guide you through a systematic approach for the evaluation of uh, uh, mitral valve regurgitation um, for surgery. And I'll be using um, uh, the guidelines that were actually published two years ago. And um, we'll talk about uh, some of the measurements that are important or that our surgeon thinks they are important and we use for communication with our surgery surgeon. And then we'll talk about um, assessment of the results. These are the guidelines I mentioned. This is a very interesting paper that came out two years ago. It's hard work of a big group of people from North America. Uh, including Annette, uh, who was involved in, this, um, in these guidelines. And what these guidelines are, they're basically a roadmap for intraoperative echocardiographers to tell them what it's expected from them to do for specific procedures. And this is what it's um, uh, written about mitral valve repair. And the guidelines propose a a uh, systematic approach that starts from evaluation of mitral valve anatomy. Um, when we talk about anatomy, it's always nice to go back to the actual anatomy of the heart. And we're now talking about the mitral valve, which is this valve that I've highlighted in this animation between the atrial, left atrium and left ventricle. It's called mitral because it resembles this uh, um, hat that's uh, still worn by uh, bishops in many churches, and if we turn it around, it looks like uh, the leaflet of the mitral valve. The mitral valve, it's, um, it's composed by two leaflets, and um, what uh, helps us orient ourselves is at usually between 11 and 12 o'clock is the aortic valve, which is anterior, and the left atal appendage, which is at about 11 o'clock. And as I said, you know, next to the aortic valve is the anterior leaflet, and away from the um, aortic valve, so opposite to it, is the posterior leaflet. The mitral valve is not just a valve, but uh, in order to have a functioning, a well-functioning valve, uh, all components of this mitral valve complex need to work in synchronous. And these components are the atrium, the annulus, the leaflet, the cordae tendine, the papillary muscle, and the left ventricular myocardium. If any of these elements uh, is pathologic or changes itself, then that affects the functioning of the mitral valve and the valve may become incompetent. What it's important to understand is the mechanisms of mitral regurgitation. How many reasons can there be for the mitral valve to leak? And uh, Carpentier, many years ago, this is from 1983, described these possible mechanisms into three types. Um, and they are divided into primary and secondary mitral valve regurgitation. And they uh, talk about and they're focused on the motion of the leaflet. So we can have normal leaflet motion where we have a dilatation of the ring or a leaflet perforation or a cleft or an indentation. We may have excessive leaflet motion, which is what we commonly see or most commonly see uh, that presents with um, um, 
um, uh, leaflet prolapse or flail. And then we have restrictive leaflet motion. Restrictive leaflet motion can occur in systole and diastole, and that's a degenerative mitral valve um, or a rheumatic mitral valve, or the, the restricted motion is only in systole due to tethering of the leaflet, which means that the, there's forces that pull down uh, on the cords and prevents the leaflet to close, but the leaflets themselves, they're actually normal. And this is uh, type 3A for systole and diastolic restriction and type 3B for only systolic restriction. <clears throat> it is always, it's very important that we understand where the problem is in the mitral valve. And uh, as you can see here, we all know, we use this uh, Carpentier nomenclature where we have divided the posterior mitral valve leaflet into three portions. They are usually identifiable due to a small indentation between them. And more laterally, we have P1. In the middle, we have P2. And medially, we have P3. Opposite to it, opposite to them, we have also divided and we divide the anterior mitral valve leaflet into one more lateral, two in the middle, and then three medial. This was for me one of the biggest challenges as I started um, learning transesophageal echocardiography in Toronto and I just couldn't understand how my staff would tell the surgeon it's a P2 problem, it's an A1 problem, it's a P3 problem. And actually, uh, for each of these, uh, so in order to see and to visualize all six of these uh, scallops, we need four or five views. And uh, these are the views that we uh, normally have and we need to visualize all of them. There's a, a, a four chamber view, mitra commissural view, two chamber view, and long axis view. Um, uh, now the challenge is always to remember which one is which. Um, what's also not always so clear is that it's not even so, we're not even 100% sure that what we see is what we think we're seeing. So when we have a four chamber view, the four chamber view cutting right in the middle of the valve, which is a perfect four chamber view, then we see the two portions. But actually, if we take this probe and we pull it up and we start to see the aortic valve, then we are no longer seeing the A2 portion of the, of the valve, but the, the two portions of the valve, but we're moving laterally. And then actually, if we push the probe in, we start to see the coronary sinus, and now we're gonna see the more medial aspect of the valve. So with the four chamber view, we can use this view to scan through the valve in and out. Something similar we can do with a long axis view where now instead of pushing the probe in and out, we can turn the probe right and left. And if we turn left, we're scanning through the more lateral aspect of the valve and the one segment. And if we rotate to the right, we scan into the more medial aspect of the valve. That's the medial, the, the three segments. Now we don't have to think too much about it anymore because we have multi we have multiple planes that can be displayed at the same time. And this is what we normally do. We display the mitral valve in the mitral commissural view, where you can see here in the middle that's highlighted in yellow. And that's, you see the yellow line on this model where it's cutting through, it's cutting through P1, which is actually to the right side where the left retro appendage is P2 in the middle. Uh, sorry, A2 in the middle and P3 to the left side, which is the mo most medial aspect of the valve. Now, if you we place the secondary plane right in the middle, what we see on the right side in the long axis, now we know for sure these are the two segments. What we can do is now stay in there, just move our secondary plane more medial or more lateral. And now if we move more medial, we're going to see the three, which is what we see to the right. Or if we move more lateral, then we're going to see the ones. That's what we see to the, to the left. Obviously, uh, uh, now we have 3D imaging. And you know I'm a big 3D fan. Um, and the 3D imaging really allowed us to fully appreciate the complex anatomy of the mitral valve. We can obtain a block of the mitral valve, we look at it from the left atrium down into the ventricle. We can see the valve just like the surgeon sees it. We can actually flip it and look at the valve from the bottom. So from the ventricle to the atrium. 
And just looking at the 3D unfast view, which is the surgical view, which is the orientation of the valve, the same way the surgeon would see it with the anterior leaflet at the top, the uh, aortic valve at 12 degrees, uh, 12 o'clock, and the posterior leaflet at the bottom. Just looking at these blocks, you can probably tell right away what type of problem we have here and, and how it correlates to what type of disease or what type of, uh, um, uh, what is the cause of the regurgitation. With 3D now and newer technology, we can make this block looking more realistic using with the Philips system, uh, so-called true view or glass view. And uh, what really I think 3D made a big difference for the mitral valve is to being able to identify um, clefts and indentation. And I, never understood how can we see a cleft in 2D. It's extremely difficult. Now, after many years of experience, I could probably make a diagnosis, but we don't need to do it anymore because if you look at the valve on the left, you can clearly see that there's a cleft between a, a P1 and P2. And if you look at the right, there's, a, there's an indentation, which is sort of an un, incomplete cleft that goes through the leaflet. And this is very important to tell the surgeon so the surgeon can appreciate uh, 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 little details that sometimes when they look at the valve, the, the, the heart is empty in diastole and the valve is not loaded and these details, may they may not be able to appreciate it. Once we have a 3D block, we can still cut this block into perpendicular planes. And we can use this multiplanar reconstruction that we did it live here, that's uh, using so-called multi-view with the Philips system. And we orient the blue plane to cut uh, through the mitral valve annulus. So now at the bottom left in the blue panel, we have the uh, mitral valve in the long axis, in the, in the short axis, and we have at the bottom the aortic valve. And now we can position our red plane right in the middle. And as we position it in right in the middle, when we look at the red panel, now we're looking at the P2 segments and the A2 segments. We take this red plane, we move it now more medially. And this is what we did on the left. And now we're seeing the three segments. You take the, this red panel and you move it to the left. And now we see the one panel. You can do it uh, as we did it live, or we can do it offline with multiplanar reconstruction. This is an example from another data set where we see uh, in the bottom left, the A1 segments in the middle, the two segments, and at the right, on the right is the three segment. And we still have, our eye can still much better appreciate um, a leaflet pathology and leaflet morphology in 2D better than in 3D. But 3D gives us like an over, uh, a, a look at the whole valve in just, just one, um, one blink, one, uh, one shot. We can take these 3D models uh, uh, with 3D block and then uh, build a 3D model of the mitral valve. We do it and we've done it many times for research purposes. We in Leipzig don't do it on a regular basis, although, um, these models, we did studies uh, when I was still in Toronto uh, with Tyrone David, who, and we demonstrated that they are reliable and they correlate with direct measurements of the valve. But, um, um, uh, and you get a whole set of automatic measurements, but this is a matter of communicating with the surgeon and making a decision together how we can use these measures for um, to guide the repairs. Now that we've looked at the anatomy of the valve, we need to evaluate the severity and confirm the severity. Uh, and how we do this, we do it with color Doppler. So with color Doppler, color Doppler will help us to further confirm the, 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 the cause of mitral regurgitation because the, the color normally goes away from the prolapse and towards restriction. So whenever we see something in 2D, we put color on, then it needs to make sense. Yeah. If it doesn't make sense, then we've, we've, we've done something wrong most likely with our 2D assessment or 3D assessment without color, because the color is always uh, is displayed where it is. Uh, the, therefore, we need to find the reason for a jet that it's, uh, that it's going in a certain direction. 
with uh, multi multiple planes or x plane or d planes or multiple plane at the same time we can use the mitra commissural view just like i showed you for the 2d image and we're gonna also uh, use this technique with uh, with the case that i'll be presenting later and we can that then use the the uh, position the secondary plane on the primary plane on the first plane so on this mitra commissural view and then scan through the valve and go look for the jet and see exactly where the jet is coming from we can use 3d color 3d color gives us a a nice depiction of where the colors come from now with the newer probes we can have a, a, a good enough temporal resolution so that uh, in one in one beat we can display the color and what is uh, and, and never to forget is that um, we are now evaluating a patient who's intubated who is mechanically ventilated and who's asleep and this patient was evaluated before in the echo lab, but he was awake and he may have had a TE and the TE was extremely uncomfortable and the blood pressure was very high. So it's important that we try to recreate in the operating room, the same physiologic conditions as we had in the echo lab when they did the preoperative assessment or what we think that pre or what we, what we, not what we think, but what we know that the preoperative condition for these patients are, um, and before the patient was put to sleep and before when the patient was breathing spontaneously. This is an example of a case of an ischemic mitral regurgitation where you can see the same patient on the left with 100 uh, over 60 blood pressure and on the right with 170 over 90 blood pressure. So what was uh, looked like a, a minimal mitral regurgitation was actually severe mitral regurgitation and this patient was actually treated for that. Well, we also have learned from uh, uh, 3D um, uh, color Doppler is that this jet that we thought that the jet is actually around, uh, comes from a round orifice. When we actually cut through it, we realize that this orifice uh, for ischemic mitral regurgitation specifically is actually not round, but it's oval. So that uh, sort of uh, speaks, so adds more information in one direction, this would be the uh, for ischemic mitral regurgitation, and also uh, uh, it highlights the the limitation of measuring the uh, vena contracta into in into the and in one play alone. So we've seen now uh, the reason for the mitral regurgitation. We've looked at the jet. Now we need to see whether. Um, there are elements that are speaking against the repair of this valve or things that may make this valve difficult to repair. What do we provide our surgeons so then they can sort of make a decision? We usually provide them the annular diameter, which is the anteroposterior diameter, the length of the leaflet, c set distance, diameter, and length of the uh, ventricle, tenting height and tenting area for ischemic regurgitation. And then we look at the distance of the circumflex from the mitral valve annulus. If you want to actually uh, um, have a roadmap that's sort of very helpful in decision-making in the OR, this is what uh, our colleagues in Boston proposed. And in this paper, there's one of the ex-fellows from Toronto General Hospital, that's Aidan Sharkey, that's become extremely productive uh, in Boston as he moved there. And you can see that what they, what they suggest is that when we see mitracuspid, mitral regurgitation, then we need to establish the pathophysiology of this function and then uh, understand whether this is ischemic or non-ischemic and then exclude predictors of repair failures. What are the predictors of repair failures that were identified by this group in this paper? These are the tenting height, the tenting area, so more than one and more than 2.5, the angle of the P3 segment of the posterior leaflet, a very dilated ventricle in diastole and in systole. And these are actually uh, uh, all the parameters that have been proposed and described in the literature to, to speak against a repair in or to 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 speak against the repair in case of ischemic mitral regurgitation. And uh, 
um, these are uh, so these are basically uh, proportional to the extent of tethering of the leaflet and to the dilatation of the ventricle. When the leaflets are extremely pulled down, when the ventricle is extremely dilated, then the chances of successful repair are are much are much low are much less. What happened though with mm, mm, ischemic mitral regurgitation is that uh, ischemic mitral regurgitation presents itself with two very different phenotypes. One phenotype, which is you see at the top, you have all portion of the leaflets anterior and posterior are pulled down into the ventricle and you have a central mitral regurgitant jet. So you see the jet is central, comes from the middle of the valve. Or when you have involvement of the posterior papillary muscle and the inferior wall of the left ventricle, then you have tethering of the P3 segment, then you have an eccentric mitral regurgitant jet. This is the case where the repair of this valve is not going to work. It's going to eventually very, very soon fail. And, and uh, here is another paper that showed that the, the most significant uh, measure uh, against, so uh, predictive of failure for mitral valve repair was a P3 tenting angle of more than 30, which basically means that the P3 segment was pulled down way more than the other segments of the valve. And this is an example of how this with multiplanar reconstruction can be measured. Uh, we are talking about the mitral valve in, in a good portion of patients with mitral valve disease, we have concomitant tricuspid valve disease. Why is it important to look at the tricuspid valve? Because if we operate the tricuspid valve at the same time as the mitral valve, the, there is no increase in risk of, of death and in morbidity for this patient. So it's basically the same. And it's not that difficult for our surgeon. What's important for us when we do minimally invasive mitral valve surgery is that, that if we need to repair the tricuspid valve, then we need to put a neckline. And <clears throat> we in Leipzig do it in the induction room uh, before we go to the OR. It happens sometimes that we identify tricuspid regurgitation when we were already in the OR and we had to put it in the OR. There wasn't really very, it um, um, uh, was an idea because the surgeon had to wait and we have to work with, uh, with, with much more stress. But uh, <clears throat> when should the tricuspid valve uh, be addressed at the same time as uh, uh, mitral valve repair? The guidelines from 2007 are very clear. All the time when the tricuspid valve regurgitation is severe, it's class one indication. When the tricuspid valve regurgitation is mild or moderate, then if the annulus is dilated, which means tricuspid valve annulus measured in the four chamber view in diastole more than four centimeters, or when there is no tricuspid annular dilatation, but there is evidence of pulmonary hypertension. <laughs> now, uh, tricuspid valve repair, uh, includes the use of a ring in the great majority of cases. So we pretty much always use a ring, whether there's so many different types of ring, complete rings, partial rings. Mm -hmm. How do we choose the ring? So at our center, what we do is we basically want to choose a ring that's pretty much as big as the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And that's why the surgeons want to know the length of the anterior mitral valve leaflet to have an idea of how big of a ring they're going to put in. Uh, other measures that's been used is the intertrigonal distance, which is basically um, the, the distance between the two commissures of the valve. We in Leipzig don't, don't really use, we don't use it. Um, how important is it to pick the right ring? Uh, uh, it's very important, but uh, the surgeons will still use a sizer. So our measurements they're not gonna be the final decision on what type of ring we're gonna use. It's more to give them an idea of how big of a ring and how much they can play with the with the, with the ring in 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 this specific patient. SAM is um, uh, is a phenomenon that can occur after mitral valve repair, and there have been many um, uh, studies describing uh, the risk factors for SAM. These are what's been um, described from Andy Maslow uh, many years ago, and that's actually included 
uh, in the um, uh, guidelines uh, from that I mentioned before from 2020. And these are the measurements we also use in Leipzig is the ratio between anterior and posterior leaflet uh, less than 1.3, uh, angle between mitral and aortic valve less than 120 degrees, septum more than 1.5 centimeters, and a C-sep less than 25. Circumflex artery runs just next to the mitral valve annulus, and there's a high chance, or is, there's always a risk that when we put stitches on the annulus, we take the circumflex within. And uh, in Leipzig, uh, we've described, my colleague described, Jörg, my, my, my boss, a few years ago in this paper, and the videos from the paper, a technique to actually look and follow the left main into the circumflex and to see how the circumflex runs in uh, um, within, so next to the uh, mitral valve annulus. We can do it with 2D, we can do it with color. And I'm gonna show you in the case later how we actually do this. Mm -hmm. um, with 3D, uh, with the 3D block we, and multiplanary construction, we can actually identify the circumflex and measure the distance between the circumflex and the annulus at different points. And here you can see we've done these measurements and we not only know the distance, but we actually know what is the distance at what and which specific points. There is an information that our surgeon actually like to have in order to sort of know how much relaxed they can be or more, more nervous uh, need to be when they put the uh, stitches in the annulus. This technique has been um, um, compared to CT uh, and actually uh, uh, demonstrated a great uh, correlation with CT in this paper. That's a work from uh, one of my colleagues, Carmine Bevilacqua, and many of my current colleagues that um, uh, work together to put uh, um, uh, together this very nice study. With minimally invasive approach, uh, as you all know, and uh, Elmery has uh, certainly gonna uh, certainly already talked about it, we need to place lines in the groin, so a venous line and an arterial line. When it comes to the uh, venous line, the first step is to identify the wire in the superior vena cava. And then uh, we advance the um, catheter, uh, the cannula in the superior vena cava. What is very important is that you need to see the wire in the superior vena cava. And I'm not going to say it, uh, I'm never going to say it enough. What's happening very often is that, especially after the wire is being placed, is in the right position, the surgeons dilate. And after the second or the third, we use three different dilators. Then the wire comes off of the inferior vena, uh, superior vena cava. Now they want to advance the catheter. That's extremely dangerous because if the wire is not in the superior vena cava, it can be in the right ventricle, it can be in the in the uh, right atrial appendage. And if we now advance the, ca the cannula with the dilator of the cannula, then there's extremely high chance that we're gonna perforate the right ventricle or the right atrium. So the surgeon must wait. If you don't see the wire in the superior vena cava, please scream, you are allowed to scream. You need to scream and tell him stop wait until I don't see the wire, you don't advance the, can the cannula. We've seen already, unfortunately, in my short time in Leipzig, enough complications because the surgeons just didn't want to listen and didn't want to wait. For the arterial cannula, we identify the wire in the descending thoracic aorta. We don't see the cannula. And as we go and pump, unfortunately, this is what can happen. This is a case of very unfortunate case of aortic dissection after cannulation of the femoral artery. After repair, what can we what do we need to look for? The guidelines uh, are suggesting that we look for residual MR. Um, uh, we need to exclude mitral stenosis, exclude SAM, and look at left ventricular uh, uh, systolic function, and then also have a look at the other valves. So what we do in Leipzig is as soon as the clamp comes off, and you can see here, now with uh, color flow, we follow and look at the circumflex and we look at flow in the circumflex. When you're still on pump, this is the time where you have the best chance and the best 
uh, uh, look at the flow in the in the circumflex. And what what you can see here, we usually drop down the Nyquist limit to 15 or 20 in order to sort of be able to appreciate lower velocity flows in the um, coronary arteries. We look at coaptation lens. Uh, in Leipzig, we never resect, we respect the leaflet. So we put new cords and it's always um, nice to see that there's a coaptation that's more than five millimeters. We look for residual MR and anything really that's more than trace or mild, we don't accept it. So we go back on pump, we try to re repair and if it doesn't work, then we need to we go and replace the valve. Mitral stenosis has to be taken into consideration. Doesn't happen very often. Ideal way is to have a, a gradient no more than four millimeters of mercury. If you have elevated gradients across the valve, you need to look at the hemodynamic conditions and you also have to look at, you can also use 3D to planimetry the valve and actually see what the effective orifice is of the valve after repair. I warned you about coronary circumflex occlusion. It does happen. Uh, when it does happen, it presents itself with lack of flow in the coronary artery, but also with a very obvious um, uh, wall motion abnormality in the lateral wall. As you can see here, this was a patient that from the OR went directly to the cat lab. And this is a, an old uh, echo, uh, which I've taken from an older presentation, but uh, this is not something that hasn't happened in the last couple of years. St still, um, once, twice a year in, in a high volume center is, is, is something that still happens. SEM uh, is a problem. You can see here uh, just a case of SEM after mitral valve repair. Um, what is the solution? Uh, volume, yeah, we can give volume, volume and beta blocker and just ignore it. That's probably not the right uh, solution. There shouldn't be any SAM. And um, we've had a case where um, uh, the, the, after we had a significant SAM, then the surgeons went, surgeon one was and was Michael Borger went back on pump and he took the ring down and put a bigger ring. And the valve was still competent and the SEM was gone. So this is something to keep in mind. If you use the smaller ring then, then, uh, then, uh, and you have SEM, then you need to think of uh, if, the, if the valve would, uh, would, uh, would be able to tolerate a, a bigger ring. Um, we, after mitral valve repair, uh, we also need to look at the other valves. And this is um, a, um, a case where uh, you can see that the aortic valve and the aortic valve annulus is basically in continuity with the mitral valve annulus. And here is a case of a patient who, as soon as uh, we came off pump and we checked the mitral valve, then uh, present itself with this aortic valve regurgitation that wasn't there. And you see it before, and you can see that the jet is not actually coming from the center of the valve from where we normally see a jet, but it's coming from the leaflet itself that actually was perforated by the surgeon as he put the stitches of the mitral valve um, ring. And this case, yeah, it's actually um, one of these cases from the experience of our surgeons in Leipzig is that the uh, mitral, iatrogenic mitral insufficiency, uh, aortic valve insufficiency as a result of um, um, uh, damaged leaflet is not gonna get better over time. So it's not something that you can say, oh, it's mild, we just leave it alone. So putting it all together, um, yeah, you, you can follow what we do in Leipzig, but there's guidelines and guidelines now are pretty clear. Um, um, the uh, mitral valve regurgitation has been extensively studied and our work as a cardiographer in the OR has been, uh, uh, has been always a key component of uh, treatment of the patients. It is important to understand the anatomy and the mechanism of mitral regurgitation. You need to uh, assess the severity in physiologic condition. You need to talk to the surgeon and create this bonding with the surgeon. And this is also the advantage of, um, of, uh, of working often with the same surgeon and actually have a strong team. And you need to be familiar with possible complications and 
uh, I, I don't have to tell you, I think it's quite self-explanatory that uh, the advent or, uh, of 3D made a big difference, especially in the uh, um, assessment of mitral regurgitation and planning for surgery. I'd like to thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for your attention. And this is my email if anyone wants to ask me questions that you didn't dare asking or you I, we didn't have time to answer. And uh, you're welcome to visit us in Leipzig for our masterclass next year in June or any time whenever you want to come and see our center and have a, a trip to Europe and Germany. Thank you very much. And um, we'll, um, uh, <clears throat> we'll have a chance to interact a bit more in the Q&A session.